Hi, my name is Mike Kinsner from Intel, and I'll be talking today about some programming models that many of us use from day to day, then going into how they relate to each other and to hardware. This work was also put together by a few other Intel engineers, specifically Ben Ashbaugh, James Broadman, Greg Lewick, John Pennycook, and Roland Schulz, all of whom are involved in Kronos through either the SICL or OpenCL standards. Let's begin with why we're even covering this topic today. When deciding which types of hardware to use when implementing or accelerating your workload, there are many options to choose from. We often think about the different forms of parallelism across these architectures when discussing programming language or library features in SICL and OpenCL, for example. Many people understand bits and pieces of the programming models, and some understand how everything fits together, but regardless, seeing it all in a single presentation can be really helpful when thinking about how to program modern hardware. Programming across today's architectures can be tough, so we'll talk about some of the language abstractions that make parallel programming easier. The presentation will focus on direct programming, specifically writing code to implement an algorithm or task explicitly. It notably assumes that you care about doing more than just calling performance-tuned libraries and are writing code that either doesn't exist in a library or writing the library itself. We'll start with the scoping of the types of parallelism that are of interest today. Then we'll look at mapping of programs to hardware, both the programming model and the tool chain's interpretation of those models. We'll cover some common languages and frameworks to see how the concepts apply. And then we'll briefly look at composition of the programming models and some takeaways. To make sure that we're all on the same page, let's start with the focus of the presentation and some definitions. Let's broadly break down parallelism to focus in on today's topic. This tends to be a really messy subject because people usually have divergent definitions in mind, even on fundamentals, like what parallelism is. We'll generalize this up to be pretty high level to scope the talk, so please don't get hung up on details. First, let's think about two programs or different streams of instructions. Those programs can each run on different pieces of the hardware, such as different cores of a CPU. We'll call this task parallelism, where different programs are running, or said another way, where different streams of instructions are running in parallel. Now let's look at what happens within one of the programs, perhaps running on one of the CPU cores. And specifically, we want to look at data parallelism, where an instruction, such as an add, might run on multiple elements of data in parallel. An example of this is in vector hardware units, where the add may be performed on, say, eight or 16 different scalar pieces of data in the same clock cycles. We'll call this data parallelism because different data is being processed by the same instruction in hardware in parallel. Put another way, we'll define data parallelism as performing an operation X on data such as A, B, C, and so on in parallel. Multiple forms of parallelism can be characterized as data parallel, including the pipeline parallelism that we often see on FPGAs and even the results of loop vectorization. We'll specifically focus on data parallelism in this talk, not things like task or instruction level parallelism, because data parallelism is where most of the confusion seems to be. If you care about other forms of parallelism, there are lots of places to look online that are really good to get both overviews and detailed documentation, and features like operating system threads for task parallelism have great documentation out there. Before we get into the core of the material, let's level set on vector hardware instructions because they exist in a lot of the processor and accelerator architectures out there today. The high level idea is that vector data, often in wide vector registers, forms the input to and output from an instruction such as an add or a multiply or a memory load perhaps, or one of many other options. The single instruction operates on the different elements of that vector in parallel with the individual elements often being called vector lanes. Vector hardware is common in modern architectures for many reasons, often focused around things like reducing silicon area and energy overheads, and also because vector operations can lead to more efficient memory access patterns, for example. 
We see vector hardware in CPU instructions, such as variants of AVX, like AVX 512, and also in the core of GPU architectures, where independent pixels are processed using lanes of vector instructions. Some architectures and tool chains expect vector instructions to be encoded in a program's binary, such that you might write a vector instruction in assembly language, while other architectures handle vectorization more dynamically. For this presentation, we'll dive into how to effectively write code that leverages data parallel hardware, such as vector instructions. Let's change gears then to how common programming models can map to data parallel hardware. The first thing that many people think about when writing code for vector hardware is to write explicit vector instructions directly into their code. We'll call this explicit single instruction multiple data or explicit SIMD, explicit SIMD. We have vector data types explicitly written into the code, such as A8 and C8, which are eight wide vector data types in this example. The most important observation about this style of programming is that a single work item or instance or thread of a program fills all of the lanes of the vector hardware instruction. A single instance of the code is sufficient to completely use the vector width, in this case, an eight wide vector instruction, and it's therefore fully used by that eight wide data type written into the source code. Explicit SIMD is in contrast to this other programming model, which we'll call single program multiple data or SPMD or SPMD. In this style of programming, code is written from the perspective of a single lane or component of the vector and multiple instances of the program run at the same time, each filling up a different lane of the vector hardware. This is a really critical concept for modern accelerator programming because it offers a number of advantages that we'll touch on soon. So remember, in SPMD, multiple instances of the program run, in some sense together or at the same time, to fill up the lanes in the vector hardware. We'll call the instances of the program work items matching OpenCL and SQL naming. Either a compiler or a runtime or maybe even hardware can be involved in mapping the SPMD work items to data parallel hardware. We'll call this programming model SPMD, but note that it is also sometimes called single instruction multiple thread or SIMT or SIMT and also other names that we consider equivalent. Let's also touch on one other programming model that's common and important to consider alongside explicit SIMD and SPMD. Here we're showing single instruction, single data, or SISD, or SISD, in which a single instance of a typically serial program somehow fills out the data parallel hardware. In this diagram, the vector width of work is somehow extracted from the serial code through a vectorizing compiler, or from programmer directives like in OpenMP or through other means. In OpenMP, for example, the for loop shown here might have a directive like pragma OMP SIMD on it. Looking at the three programming models together, we can touch on some of the advantages of each. Starting from the left, SISD is an easy model to get started with if you know conventional non-parallel programming or if you have scalar code bases that you want to incrementally port to a parallel architecture. Parallel programming from SISD code is effectively one school of thought and a mental model that some people find very easy to reason about. In the middle, explicit SIMD is often desired by extreme experts that understand all of the hardware details of a specific device. The code maps almost directly to advanced hardware features, in many cases at least, but tends to be very hard to move to different architectures without significant rework and code divergence. On the right, SPMD has become a very popular programming model for parallel hardware because it tends to be more portable across architectures and also generations of a single architecture where things like vector widths may change a bit. It's also often easier to write code from the perspective of lanes instead of considering the full vector width altogether. And it, it lets tooling also take care of some of the really complex details like lane masking for you behind the scenes. This is good for both mental model as well as portability and avoiding bugs.
All of these models have their place in devoted users, but the right-hand SPMD model has become the most common for offload accelerator programming these days. So the first takeaway message that we land on is that SPMD code, in which multiple work items of your program together occupy the data parallel hardware, is often an easier mental model to work with and tends to be more portable across different architectures or generations of an architecture. SPMD also maps nicely to a wide variety of data parallel architectures going well beyond just vector compute, including pipeline spatial architectures like are often constructed on FPGAs. Now that we've touched on programming models like SPMD, let's explore an equally important part of the picture around a tool chain's interpretation of a program. To highlight the concepts in an easy to understand way, let's talk about how a compiler might interpret a vector data type that you write into your code, such as a float four, meaning a four wide single precision floating point vector, like in this example. First, consider the perhaps obvious case where a compiler takes that float four and maps the four elements in it to the lanes of a four wide vector hardware instruction. In this case, we interpret the vector as explicit SIMD and map it directly to multiple lanes of the hardware from within the single work item. Expert developers often desire this type of mapping when trying to reach peak performance on some hardware, and it's effectively like writing direct assembly code or using hardware intrinsics, but through a higher level language. The challenge we hit is that an explicit SIMD interpretation of a vector doesn't play nicely with the SPMD programming model, where multiple work items are also cooperating to fill out the vector lanes. The other major interpretation of a vector in source code looks like this, where instead of using up multiple vector lanes, the vector in source code instead uses up one lane, but executes the operation, like the add in this case, over multiple clock cycles. The vector is effectively unrolled across time into a single lane of the vector hardware. This view gives less direct control over the specific hardware instructions, but by keeping the work items or lanes independent, makes code much more portable across architectures or generations of an architecture, and can be easier to reason about when tuning code. Really critically, the right side view gives the compiler and runtime more flexibility on how to map a program to hardware. It can map to different types of devices and even to pipeline parallelism in spatial architectures transparently, for example. To write performant code, you need to understand very clearly which interpretation and mapping your compiler has chosen to implement for things like vectors appearing in the source code. Things like interpretation of a vector are not always defined by a programming language or API, for example, in OpenCL, because doing so could limit the ability for the standard to target some hardware. But in that case, tool chains and implementations then do need to decide what mapping to choose and implement. And not only do you need to understand those choices to write performant code in many cases, but you also need to consider those choices of targeting multiple architectures or tool chains. This brings us to the second takeaway. Since lowerings from language features to hardware are sometimes intentionally not defined by a language or library standard, you need to understand what your tools do in order to reason about how to achieve performance. We've just looked at how the interpretation of a vector data type in source code can depend on implementation decisions in the tooling. But taking this further, even basics like whether code is interpreted and executed as SPMD at all can depend on the implementation. A part of this takeaway is that you can learn what a specific tool does and write code to that mapping, but in many cases, things may fall apart the second you try to run somewhere else or if the tool changes. We either need to understand this and take it into account when writing code that targets multiple architectures, or need to stay within language constructs that have a clear and mandated lowering to hardware, such as the MRA math array class in SICL 2020. When looking at a pure programming model, such as SPMD, where lanes of the vector hardware execute different work items per lane, it becomes clear that some control of the hardware is missing from the abstraction. We're going to talk about two features that allow us to step outside the pure model, but in a well-defined and easy to reason about way. The first of these is subgroups that give SPMD code a mechanism to refer to groups of work items, which may run together on vector hardware, 
and to perform operations that involve multiple lanes of the hardware, such as cross-lane broadcasts or algorithms which might have hardware support. OpenCL and SQL, for example, have groupings of work items called workgroups and subgroups. Algorithms like data reductions can be applied to both groupings, but subgroups are designed to map cleanly to cross-lane operations in vector hardware, while workgroups usually have other purposes. If coding for the best performance and you're running on an architecture that has optimized vector hardware, subgroups enable tuning to specific architectures while still creating portable code that's easy to reason about. Subgroups provide a handle in the language that can be used to step outside the pure SPMD model for small chunks of your code, while still writing most of the code from the single lane perspective. There are details about whether work items in a subgroup are guaranteed to execute together, and details about things like forward progress guarantees that we don't have time to cover in today's talk. But what matters is that subgroups provide a consistent abstraction through which to reason about and invoke cross-lane operations within the SPMD programming model. So next, let's briefly look at how the previous concepts apply to a few of the commonly used parallel programming languages and frameworks. Looking at SQL, OpenCL, CUDA, OpenMP, and COCOS, we see a clear trend towards SPMD as the common baseline programming model. The exception is OpenMP, where composition of SPMD with SISD and programmer directives is common, in part due to heritage, and in part because some developers have a mental model that fits better with SISD plus directives. How vector types are interpreted is an interesting comparison. SICL, CUDA, and COCOS have aimed to clearly encode the desired semantic, whereas OpenCL has not, which potentially leads to more adoption across architectures, but less portability. When looking at how to access cross-lane abstractions and algorithms, which in some sense requires stepping outside of the pure SPMD programming model, SICL, OpenCL, CUDA, and COCOS have defined abstractions to enable multi-work item collective operations. Each has chosen a different design point in code and implementation, but fundamentally, they all enable a well-defined way to step outside the pure SPMD model when required. We've touched on how subgroups in OpenCL and SICL provide a well-defined way to access cross-vector lane operations from within the SPMD programming model. Now let's touch on another such feature. From experience, we see that experts writing code to access top performance from a specific device often want to code directly to an architecture, but usually only for a very small percentage of their code, maybe even only one instruction or a few instructions. This can be to access a new hardware feature that hasn't been exposed in higher level languages yet, or to achieve optimizations that the compiler either won't or can't do. Sometimes we see this problem solved through inline assembly, which some tools support, but that's clearly not a portable solution. Let's touch on an extension proposal that aims to provide a better solution. First, let's overview the extension. We'll skip many of the details and hit on only the major points, which are what we really care about today. Near the top is a function called scale with a SIMD vector input and output. This function is internally written in an explicit SIMD style. Near the bottom, we have an API called invoke SIMD, which takes a subgroup as an argument and calls the scale function. The invoke SIMD call is made within typical SQL SPMD code. In contrast, once we're inside the called scale function body, the model switches to explicit SIMD for the duration of that function call. This extension combines the abstraction of a subgroup, which is a one-dimensional collection of work items, with a clearly defined switching of programming model in the context of that specific subgroup at that point in the program's execution. Shown another way, with program execution time going downward on the slide, we see that the invoke SIMD call switches the model from SPMD with multiple work items to explicit SIMD within the invoke SIMD called function, and then back to SPMD with multiple work items when the function returns. The vector inputs and output are formed from the data passed to invoke SIMD by each of the work items participating in the subgroup. And the width of the SIMD input and output vectors in the scale function therefore matches the size of the subgroup, 
since each work item in the subgroup contributes an element to each vector. In the called function, which is explicit SIMD, the function occupies all lanes of the subgroup through a single instance of the scale function that's executing. This is versus the code before and after the invoke SIMD call in program order, where we have SPIMD code. This extension aims to enable stepping outside of the SPIMD model for very rare use cases, and to enable this in a way that lets most of the code, let's say 99.9%, .9 be within the SPIMD model for portability and ease of programming, while simultaneously providing a well-defined interface, semantics, and type safety when needed. So this leads us to a third takeaway. If we look at a pure programming model like SPIMD or explicit SIMD, they tend to create gaps for some use cases, either in portability or in the ability to achieve maximum performance on a specific architecture. Features like subgroups and invoke SIMD have been evolving that let the pure abstraction be used most of the time to harness the portability and mental model of SPIMD, while still enabling stepping outside of the model in well-defined ways that are also easier to reason about. Now let's touch on one final topic slide and then go into a recap. The real world of architectures can of course be more complex than we've covered. Let's touch on a few such cases to draw some conclusions. In the top left, we have a case where each SPIMD work item occupies more than one hardware vector lane, but not all of the lanes. In this case, two work items, each using four lanes, together occupy the full eight wide vector width of the hardware. This is a sort of hybrid mapping because it combines the multiple work items of SPIMD with explicit SIMD lowering to vectors in hardware. We can consider a special case of the top left as we move to the bottom, where explicit vector code in a single work item sometimes lowers to a vector operation. An example of this is where memory access hardware is provided that allows a small vector, perhaps say two or four floats or ints, to be loaded or stored by each work item. But otherwise, each work item has only a single scalar lane for operations like add or multiply. By moving to the top right, we have an explicit SIMD case where there isn't a one-to-one -one mapping between vectors and code in the hardware. The code in this case is unrolled in time across multiple cycles on the hardware. These sorts of implementations and mappings can expose performance through very specific hardware optimizations, but they hurt portability, make it harder for developers to reason about what code to write, especially across architectures. It can make it harder to achieve performance in a bounded time. When looking for portability or an accessible mental model for developers, it's really important to consider how these cases are exposed and even how hardware is designed. Special cases that step beyond the typical models need to be clearly documented and have very carefully designed language features and semantics. To recap the styles of mapping in one place, let's start with the pure SPIMD mapping, where a vector in a work item is unrolled over time within a single lane of the vector hardware. We can call this a math convenience vector mapping, which is often desired in cases like dealing with the multiple channels of image pixels. And it's exposed in SQL 2020 as an MRA class. Next, we have subgroups that allow groupings of work items to collaborate through cross-lane operations and algorithms, which might happen to be accelerated in hardware. We also have cases where for small amounts of code, there might be desire by experts to step into an explicit SIMD domain for very advanced tuning. The key is to enable this in a bounded region of code with clear semantics and safety. And then finally, here is one that we haven't talked about yet, but it's the case where all of the code may be explicit SIMD. This ends up being very non-portable, often even across generations of a single hardware device, but is occasionally asked for by experts writing libraries. We shouldn't ignore this case, but it's also not the general case that typical developers are productive with. To conclude, let's go over the three messages that we hope you take away from this talk. First, the SPIMD model, with multiple work items creating data parallel operations and hardware, can significantly improve code portability across architectures and tends to be an easier mental model for many people to work with.
Second, achieving performance requires not only understanding of the programming model, such as SPIMD, but equally importantly, requires understanding of how a specific tool chain or implementation has chosen to interpret flexibility that exists in a specification. Neither of these in isolation is sufficient. Third, working with a pure programming model often isn't enough, and when a tool chain enables breaking from the pure model, it's important that it do so in well-defined ways consistent with the rest of the programming model. Otherwise, only a very small set of experts will be able to reason about how to write correct and performant code. If you see cases where inconsistent or ill-fitting decisions were made, push vendors to do better. Thanks for taking the time to listen in today, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of iWaccle and SickleCon.